Hello everyone, and welcome to the final chapter of my 0% low turn count playthrough of A Vestrian Tale. The final map of this game may have a familiar setup to some of you. Um, it has the one final boss that we need to kill, but we can't just walk up to him. He is protected by a series of barriers that, unfortunately, we cannot warp past. Um, those barriers are, in turn, protected by three mini-bosses, so we need to kill a total of four bosses total in this map. Uh, we'll kill a lot more generic enemies, but those are who we're focusing on. I want to give special attention to the Morning Lotus, the sword we got last map. It is effective against the final boss, so you can tell that our final boss killer is going to be Jerez. I also want to give attention to the Angelic Robe there, which Gianepro is going to use to make um, enemy phase one uh, not as tough to deal with. Uh, we're going to pull out the Armor Slayer here. I've done a lot of hyping up of that weapon, uh, despite it only appearing once, but um, it's going to be doing a whole lot of work this clear. Um, you can see the path forks off into three different directions. Each one is capped by a mini-boss. Um, I want to give a proper introduction to the only returning unit from Chapter 8, Magritte, um, the Dragoon there. He's the Godo of this game. Really good. Not quite as good as the Armor Slayer, which is just going to one-shot that Armor Knight there. And uh, we're going to rescue Escada to make his way towards the rightmost boss. Um, the right side is pretty much taken care of with that action, so we're going to rush Zeke up here and have him take all of our good items from the left, from the right side and just drop them in the convoy so the other sides can use them too. Um, a couple low percent crits are going to be coming out here. The enemy phase is very shady, and by leaving a couple more enemies alive, it'll be even more shady, so I don't want to do that. I want to pull out the rescue staff, pull out the lucky coin, give that to Jerez, because he's got to get moving sooner or later, and crit kill this mercenary here. Um... Lafayette's Siege Tome, the Dramatic Iris, normally does a fixed 10 damage, but uh, its ability to crit was not removed, so I'm back on my bullshit here. Uh, Magritte, he's going to be kind of shoring up our defenses here. That's his main purpose um, going into this clear, and um, while he's busy handling the left side, we're going to reposition Jerez over the cliff there, so he can uh, start taking on the center. Um, you can see he's going to pull the Armor Slayer back out of the convoy, and um, once again, cleave through another Armor Knight. Uh, this is just so handy, because look at his beautiful, beautiful five strength. The Rapier is not helping us with these Armor Knights. Um, with that strength, but um, the Armor Slayer is a beautiful thing. Magritte is going to jump ahead of the Alva here and equip the Devil Lance. Uh, Ginepro lures that soldier away from Zeke, uh, and that fighter, seeing he can break the Devil Lance, will go for Magritte instead of Alva. Um, our biggest chances of failure here are Alva, who can die pretty easily, and Jerez. We're not going to have time to heal Jerez, so we want him to dodge every single enemy that's going to come his way. Um, that includes these two and a siege enemy. Um, a lot of the enemies towards the start of this map are actually stationary, so our chance of death isn't as horrible as it looks with like those sages and that soldier and that sniper. It's not too bad, um, but getting Jerez to dodge absolutely everything was mandatory. Um, moving on into turn two, once Alva lives that magic sword mirror, um, we're just going to slice right through the enemy warrior here. You can take a good look at the three bosses we need to take care of, and uh, thankfully, these first two are pretty easy to reach. Um, 
Alva, with her celerity skill, can just walk right up to the Swordmaster and Brave Lance him to death. Doesn't even need a crit. But the Central General there is a bit of a problem. Jerez can't deal with them, because Jerez needs to be attacking the final boss. Enter Alyssa. Um, she needs to boost Jerez by a little bit so he can reach the final boss. Um, but she also needs to be the one to kill that general. So we're going to rescue Iblis, dance Alyssa, and then get a rapier crit on the general boss there. Um, <laughs> as we kill this final uh, mini boss, the barriers are going to drop. And Jerez, although he is the only sword using unit I have that can double the final boss, um, he's a little short of one rounding, thankfully. Um, after a shove turn one, Lafayette is just barely in range to grab 10 HP chip on Wilhelm here. And um, in what is some of the cleanest combat I've ever seen on a final boss, Jerez is going to just finish off what's left of him here. That is going to be the first stage of the final map, completed in two turns. There is, however, a second stage. Frankly, this was the real final map. Final two here is more of a victory lap. Um, it's playing more cheerful music. Um, the sorcerer, who was trying to help his dragon lady here, um, didn't succeed. And the dragon lady has gone berserk. And we need to put her down before she uh, deals any more damage, unfortunately. Um, I'm not going to be rigging this combat here. Uh, frankly, you can see everyone's um, within striking distance of Vor Fortuna here, and um, she's not hard to deal with. Um, that is going to be final two, completed in one turn, and that's going to bring our total turn count to 32 turns. And with that, my... 0% low turn count playthrough of a Vestrian Tale comes to a close. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and if you'd like to stick around, um, I have quite a few questions for the Q&A during the credits here. Um, but first, I would like to give a big thank you to Toffee, Crash Boom Bang, Lug, and everyone else in the Hackrom Overspill Discord channel that was able to uh, listen to me bounce ideas off of without the graceful charity of all these uh, users, this run would not have been possible. Um, but on to the questions themselves. I have a couple from BPAT who asks, in what ways is AVT different to LTC than other games or hacks? And... Um, I think it really shines through in uh, the last two maps of this run. I It's no secret that chapters 8 and 9 are my favorite clears in this whole playthrough, and just the combination of the global rescue and the multiple units with on-map convoy access made them super interesting to plan out and execute. Um, RW asks which chapters are my favorite, and, and it's those two um, from a from a planning perspective. Um, BPAT asks, how much did Thracia style mechanics make it different? And, you know, I tried to point out in instances like the rescue staff and um, the armor slayer where stealing and capturing, which I assume BPAT mostly meant here, came into play, but I didn't end up using them all that much in the grand scheme of things, just because I'm able to avoid a lot more combat than the average playthrough, but 
they definitely were a consideration uh, during each chapter. Um, RW asks, uh, that's long for random wizard. Uh, what made me choose ABT specifically as a game to do an LTC run of? And besides the rescue plus convoy thing that I talked about in BPAT's question, uh, there's also the units Alva and Yahashua. Um, both of those units are insane in a casual run, and I wanted to see what happens when you take away their growths, uh, especially with Alva, and you kind of stretch the game to its limits, how these two like borderline broken units are going to behave. Uh, and that was a big driving factor early on. Um, RW also asks if there are any aspects of AVT or of my run that I didn't, that I don't feel like I fully showed off. And uh, yeah, besides the fact that I don't um, show off the story in these clears, um, I feel like a big thing that really defines AVT that I was not able to show off is the chaos in this game. You know, the 1RN system, the 99 hit cap, and all the random events. Um, I feel like something was lost there in my showing of a perfectly optimal play, um, especially with the secrets, because, you know, you're supposed to, like, stumble upon those or get some rumors from other users and you know the chaotic nature of this hack is really what makes it special um rose is quite the chaos sorcerer if i do say so myself um so if you ever want to play this hack uh, after seeing my run just keep that in mind um it really is a blast though um Rivian asks what surprised me the most about um, the LTC, and that actually gets into a big revision I had to do of this run. Um, I was talking to my buddy Lug uh, while I was finishing up like the first draft, and he was like, well, I was going like, yeah, since rescue is so powerful in this game, it really helps to have two rescue staff users. And Lug kind of offhand just goes, yeah, Ginepro's gotta be crazy, you know? I can't believe Miss Parsley, um, like she gets rescue rank way too late. And you know, at the time I was thinking, I'm really gonna shock him because Miss Parsley's my second rescue staff user. But then I was like, wait a minute, what if he's right? What if, what if, what if I need to be training Ginepro this whole time instead of Miss Parsley? So that was the biggest revision that I had to do. Um, Miss Parsley's extra movement never actually came in handy, uh, but Ginepro, his really good staff rank, uh, helped save a turn in Chapter 8 that she never could have, so shoutouts to Luke. I don't, he didn't know that he helped a revision here. Um, both Rivian and RW ask about the story and what I think of it, and I really like it. Um, I must admit, uh, because I've been playing through these chapters so much, I ended up skipping uh, the story, like, my, like, third or fourth time through, you know? And so a lot of those specifics are kind of foggy, but one thing I'll never forget is the, um, the presentation. It's really amazing for a GBA game, especially chapter six really sticks out to me. Um, this big library that you're in as you talk to someone who doesn't really exist in mainline Fire Emblems, a textbook author, or a spellbook author, but totally makes sense to exist in a world like this. Um, it's my favorite chapter story-wise, story and it's got just an amazing atmosphere. Same with chapter 8. Fantastic atmosphere. That's what I really love about the story of this game. Um... BPAT asks who my favorite unit is, uh, and I must admit, I'm not going to be able to narrow it down to one unit. Um, it's going to be Jerez and Coventry. Those two, 
They're my favorite delinquent duo. Jerez was so fun to use in this run. And Coventry, I, I turned my nose up at him uh, on my blind run. I saw he had bad combat stats, but he was, he was a blast to use. I put him in every single chapter that I could. Um, those two, they're awesome. Uh, rounding out our Q&A here is the creator of the hack himself, Rose, who asks what I think the biggest flaw of this hack is. And um, there are two answers I have. One of them's kind of fake, so I'll start with that one in that the hack's just, just too damn short. Um, it's a really good problem to have, but eight and nine are so much, so much deeper uh, in terms of LTC planning because you finally have all these tools compiled with the rescue and the convoy that I wish I had more chapters like that where I can um, really dive into the intricacies of this game's mechanics. Um, but, you know, the chapter, you know, the game's over after I get to do it twice. Um, little unfortunate. The other one that's kind of unfortunate is... Uh, the ending's pretty downer. Um, I don't know if you, the viewer, have been reading these ending cards, but a lot of them are pretty sad, uh, including uh, our good buddy Zeke, who ends up in prison once again uh, without escaping. And, you know, I've gotten really attached to this cast. Um, it was unfortunate that uh, Zeke trusted a cop, but uh, she was a pretty good unit in his defense, so... I don't know, give and take there. Um, the other question by Rose. Um, Rose asks, is Pot of Greed a broken card? And you know, uh, I gotta say, a lot of people think it's a really good card, and it's hard to disagree with them. Um, but I wouldn't quite say broken, because uh, you can only bring one Pot of Greed, but... Like, you can bring three Electric Snake, so what's the real broken card? You tell me. Um, and with that said, uh, that's the Q&A. I hope you all enjoyed. Um, and, you know, I'll see you for the next project. <laughs>